Welcome, everyone. Oh, sorry, that's a little loud. So we're at 1 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. Um, looking over the list of presentations, it just looks like a great day, so we hope to add to that. I um, hope nobody was scared off by the name of our presentation. I've just titled so many of these presentations, I felt like doing something a little bit different. I thought the title of Five Ways to Get Your Kids to Drop Out of Sports might be a really good way to go to kind of catch someone's attention. So um, I'm Michael King. I'm currently a graduate student pursuing my PhD here at Utah State. Uh, professional background, I got my master's in marriage and family therapy also here from Utah State. So I currently practice um, here in the Valley and I enjoy that quite a bit. Um, I'm going to let uh, Ryan Dunn in introduce himself in a second, but I also want to recognize we have Dr. Travis Dorsch, um, the, the founding director of the Families in Sport Lab here on campus, here with us, and we'll likely turn to him a couple times throughout this presentation, get his insight on um, the latest and most current research and some um, additional directions that this research might go. So, Ryan? Thanks, Michael. It's good to see you here. One of the things I love about conferences is the variety of choices that you have, and to see who distills down into the, the group when you have a conversation. And, and it points in a number of different directions. Some folks may just be in here because of, of the options. This was the, the, the least painful choice in this particular hour. But there are some other reasons that you might be in here, and that is because in such a world as sport, and we're going to talk about these statistics in just a second, it is an area in which almost every child and every family, even if it's for just one season, has some part of their life take place. And because the greater conversation on family and family resilience can be built or can be broken in such a setting, we'd love to spend some time with you today through the research that's been going through the Family and Sports Lab up here to be able to share some insights as to how you might support that from whatever role you find yourself, parents, grandparents, coaches, and spectators. Um, as, as Michael said, my name is Ryan Dunn. I uh, graduated with my uh, PhD from Utah State a few years ago, worked very closely hand in hand with Dr. Dorsch over here as he came on campus. Uh, we were kind of ships in the night. He was coming to campus as I was leaving and we started a, a great friendship over lunch one day as we were batting back and forth ideas on how we could collaborate in a world that was prior to that, a uh, financial planning background exclusively to the fact that in this world of sport, we both had the overlap of, of very much enjoying that part of our own lives, but also the fascination that we saw in terms of how families support or not little ones' enjoyment of their sport experience. And so first we got together in one of our, our first studies, we may mention a little bit of this later, had to do with uh, how when families invest and support their children in their sports, how much is that a support or how much is that, can that be a distraction from how they enjoy that? You send that forward for me, Mike. So if you look at Family and Sports Lab and what our work looks like here at Utah State, I'm currently down at Weber and, and we're expanding the family as individuals graduate, which is fascinating to see in different communities how sport looks. As much as it's the same, there are some a variety of things that we run into. Um, our work, including that first uh, study that, that Dr. Dorsch and I did, has, has seen some pretty significant attention around the country. Um, in academia, you measure the strength, if you will, of your publications by how many times it gets cited by other works. And, and I don't know, have you seen the current count on it? It's very minimal. 48 citations on that study that we did a couple of years ago. But yet, it was extended to the viewership of those who read Time Magazine and the Wall Street Journal because why, part of the reason why you're here, it's such an interesting topic that captures so many people's attention children in sports, such a, a big area. And we work with NCAA. We work with a, a number of leagues throughout the state of Utah. And almost without exception, as we're talking to both administrators and parents, one of the things they find is this could be made a lot better if all the adults would come in and sit through such a meeting as this and learn what to and not to say from the sidelines. And so within that, and the tongue in cheek that Michael extended as we began all of this, we take the commonly experienced ways that we do things and maybe put a how do I address this as opposed to just simple do's and don'ts. So as I talked to you before and we look at the research across the board between the ages of say five, six, seven, eight, and 18, 90 plus percent of all the youth in the United States participate in activities such as organized sport. So it gives us a ready place for us to study family and family dynamic. Um, we found through a variety of studies that there are a list of potential outcomes that include everything from better health choices to better grades to teamwork to problem solving and so forth that can be found in sport. 
But we've also found that sport doesn't do that on an island by itself. It has to do with the system in which that sport or that activity is provided where those will come out. Um, now, within that group of 90% of all youth across the United States, we also find that by about the time that our children are hitting puberty, seven in 10 are dropping out. And noting all of the benefits that can be had, our concern is what are we missing out on and what is it that's happening in the system of these activities that's causing so many to decide, you know what, I'm not interested anymore. And what we found is that from, for, uh, from sports not being fun anymore, or that there's too much pressure for us to win, or last but not least, that there's an overemphasis on the details that I didn't sign up for, our young ones are deciding, you know what, I think I've come to the end of this. Maybe even before their body is at its full size and talent is at its full capacity for them to see where they might really thrive. All right, I'll turn this over to Mike for a sec. All right, so to prepare our discussion a little bit further, there's um, a great documentary out there uh, called The State of Play, and there's a particular part of that documentary, I think it's, it's called Trophy Kids. That really gives us kind of an in-depth view of some of the issues that, especially at higher levels of sport participation, that we're seeing within family relationships. So assuming um, technology is smiling upon us today, we're going to go ahead and give this a watch. If I can have you get with a partner, get with someone around you, or just a group around you, I want you to just talk about reactions to that video, what you noticed and what came to mind for you. So let's just take a minute to go ahead and do that. It's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, take a few more moments, wrap up your discussion.
in high school and college ball. I was like, you know, encourager or telling her this, but now I see it more through my daughter and my oldest grandson mm -hmm. playing more. It's like, don't say those words, you know, don't act that way or whatever because it doesn't help them out. But it like, was I that way when my daughter was playing ball and stuff? So now I see it through, through my grandson. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely, and, and as our, our stage in life changes, because we take that role, maybe we're that child that's participating, and then we're the parent, and then we're the grandparent. It's always kind of take, you know, have that reflective type of exercise of what was I in that other role? Um, you know, so my son's, my oldest is six. We've just started out, you know, doing the t-ball, doing the soccer, and I've really had to watch myself because I've been studying this for, you know, a number of years now. And that first t-ball game, you know, I had to give Katie a warning. I was just like, just watch me, because I know how competitive I am. Like, I remember how I was in that role as the athlete, and I was taking on a new role as, as a parent. I was like, just, just let me know. Give me the nudge, give me the kick, give me whatever, whatever needs to be done if I, if I could have a hand. <laughs> Great point. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I think they were making it more about them and their reputation or their perception mm -hmm. of the community rather than the, the child's. Uh, perception. Mm -hmm. They're reliving their youth through the, through their child. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Travis, if I can kind of lean on you at this point here of, of just this thought of that vicarious living. You've worked a lot with high-level groups, worked with their parents in that situation. You've participated at the highest levels of sport. You've probably seen this, this vicarious living both from that research side, but also that, you know, an intimate personal side as well in your, in your own experiences. I mean, what I mean, what could we glean from you as far as, uh, as this point goes? Yeah, it's tough to disentangle sport from other developmental contexts that we see our kids in. And I think as parents, there's this sort of evolutionary urge for us to want to see our kids always do better and achieve more than we did. Right? That's kind of the main goal of parenting, I think, for a lot of us, is to see our kids go one step further than we did. Um, so in sports, I think oftentimes this vicarious living, so to speak, comes from the idea of, look, you know, I, I played in high school but couldn't quite get over the hump and, and participate in college. So I really want to see my kid be able to do that. So I'm going to do everything in my power to s ensure that my child gets one step further than I did. And in doing so, you know, we, we again, we label this mm -hmm. as support. I'm being super supported, putting the money down, being there at all the games, driving, driving them here, hiring the offseason trainer. That very same objective set of behaviors that we might label as support, our child might see as pressure. So yeah, we, we really need to be careful in this 
excuse me, in this sort of vicarious, uh, in this vicarious cycle that we can fall into. And it's, it's again, it's not just sports. Um, we, we see this perhaps going matriculating in college, right? If we only achieve the high school education, we want very desperately for our child to go on and go to college because we think that will afford him or her better opportunities than we had. So I think just checking yourself, Michael described a really cool process that he has uh, with his wife, like, look, you know, we study this stuff and we're not perfect. So sometimes we need our spouse or our partner or a friend or another parent to check us at the door as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It makes me think of, um, so I, I mentioned Doc Gordon a little bit earlier. Another thing that he always is, he, he always um, brings it back to is I've never met a parent that is deliberately trying to mess up their child or mess up their experience. It's a, it's a similar concept that I talk about with couples when I'm meeting with them in therapy. It's, you have healthy needs, you have unhealthy ways of expressing them right now. And what we're trying to do is give you more healthy ways to express that concern, to you know, discuss that need, to talk about something that's been on your mind. We just need more healthy ways of doing it. So, you know, in that financial piece that, that Ryan was discussing earlier, you know, a common question that we got as a result of that is like, okay, what's the magic number? Okay, so beyond what point am I spending too much on sport? Because, you know, at first glance, that was kind of the point of it is, you know, as that money increased, that we saw the joy in the experience go down. And so they're like, okay, well, when, when, when is too much too much? But that wasn't the point. It's what that money, we hypothesized what that money did to their behavior. As if I'm going to throw in this much money, we better be getting something out of this experience. If I'm going to be devoting up to 10% of our family's income to this experience, by golly, something better be coming out of it. And so here comes that pressure, even if we don't realize um, that it's there. Great. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay, next slide then. So then let's move on to our discussion here. Um, so for those of you who want to know how to mess up youth sport for your child, um, I guess I am going to be helpful for you today, but I'm anticipating that most, if not all of you, don't actually have that as your goal from today's presentation. So I, 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 I present this tongue in cheek, but number one, a great way to mess up the youth sport experience is to ignore your child's developmental stage. Youth sport should look different for a five-year-old and a 17-year-old, yes or no? Yes, very good. The experience is just going to need to look different because you have two individuals at completely different stages. Two individuals that are going to be looking for something completely different from sport. So some questions, questions to consider if we're talking about developmental stage within sport. Should sport participation look different at different ages? We just talked about that. You know, a lot of these children right here, this is pre-puberty, and so if we're going to put all our effort into teaching skills, having the exact right movements, and then all of a sudden, uh-oh, here comes puberty. A couple years later, they're now a foot and a half taller with a completely different body. Those skills will likely translate, but only to an extent, because now they've just been given a brand new body. And so there is some things to keep in mind there. What might age appropriate look like among different sports? Because if we think of different sports, you take gymnastics might be a good example here. That I mean, Travis, what would you say the physical peak or physical prime for a gymnast uh, for a gymnast is? What age? From Thirteen to seventeen. Okay, thirteen to seventeen. That's kind of your peak. Where if you take these these other sports, I mean, if I mean the example, uh, you know, I come from a tennis background, so that's what's on my mind. You think of folks like Nadal and Federer who are creeping up on their 40s and they're still winning these major tournaments. It's just two completely different sports. So what age appropriate look like, you'll have to keep the specific sport in mind. Did you see who won this, this weekend? I, I didn't catch it. As far as French Open or? Who won the French Open? Yeah. Oh, Nadal. Oh, okay. just wanted to hear you say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, just 12, no big deal. Probably end up with 15. It's a running joke. He's a huge Federer fan. <laughs> yeah, that major's record, it's getting pretty close now, so Federer fans are getting a little nervous. All right, so then if we think of these different, um, I want to present these different models of sport, or different ways of approaching sport. This first one, the developmental model of sport. So in this model, athletes are moldable and sport is an arena for learning. Success is measured in terms of personal growth, enjoyment, and skill development. This model is employed in most recreational and competitive youth sports settings. So here's one model. The other model that we'd present to you is the professional model. So in this model, athletes are commodities and sport is a commercial enterprise. 
Success in this context is measured in time, travel, wins, and dollars. This model is employed in most elite youth sports settings. Um, so I'm not here standing, standing here today saying, you know, labeling right and wrong, but just giving you a way to think about, okay, if I'm, you know, enlisting, you know, um, signing my kid up for a certain sport, what kind of model am I observing? Or if we've just finished a season, what I uh, just finished a season, what type of model have I observed this year? And is it the model that I want for, for my child? So let's go ahead and, and we'll kind of come back to this discussion. So if we think of uh, a way of developmentally appropriate, let's give you something to consider here, of these three different stages, and you can go ahead and bring them all up. Is this is kind of a way I've, I've found it helpful um, from the work of Cote, just a way to observe, okay, what's developmentally appropriate? What's kind of a general guide that will help us approach this youth sport experience? So we have these different phases or stages here to our participation. The first one that they describe is sampling, ranging from about uh, 6 to 13 years old. And it's important to keep in mind these stages aren't age, um, they're age related, not necessarily age dependent. The second stage, specialization, 13 to 15 years old. And then the stage of investment, 15 years on. So then we'll go into more detail on, on each of these. So sampling that, ages 6 to 13. So shout out again to Travis Dorsch. We've got some pictures of him up here on the slides today. So again, we think um, sampling. So if we can jump back. So multiple activities with free play, with a lot of breaks in between. So we'll bring this up multiple times today, but there's this ongoing myth, or what we've just started calling the big lie in youth sport, that in order for my child to play at the highest levels, they need to start early and they need to devote themselves to one sport. I sometimes just refer to it as this fast moving train that if you miss one of those first stations, no way. You know, you have those people talk about, you know, in their, their sophomore, junior year of high school, it's like, well, I'm really interested in that sport. I've never tried it. Do you think I could, do you think I could make the team? I really hope you can, but the reality is a lot of times um, they've kind of picked those teams pretty far in advance and they're already kind of having their eyes on children well before they even make it to that point. So again, the reality of, uh, of the situation of um, getting children to be able to participate at the highest levels, the big lie is that they have to participate in one and participate a lot and not have these multiple sports and these multiple breaks. I mean, we kind of have our living evidence here in the room today where Travis went on to play in the NFL. I mean, yeah, he played a lot of football growing up, but there was also a lot of this, a lot of baseball, a lot of soccer, and I'm assuming a lot of other sports and a lot of opportunities as well. And Travis, if I can just pull on your experience again to help or hurt that, that sampling that took place. Across our research, uh, that's leading to elite participation. Uh, you know, nobody nobody says I'm going to be an engineer when they're six and start studying engineering textbooks, right? You let these things develop over time, and ultimately, when physical and cognitive maturity meet somewhere post adolescence, then we can kind of start to hone in on what we enjoy and what we're good at, and it's the same in sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we can bring up Nadal again, if that that latest example again, he he was playing high level soccer until he was 12 or 13 when he was finally said, okay, it's, it's time to choose. And he said, soccer, I really like that. I think I might even be able to be better at that, but I see that more as my hobby, as more something I enjoy outside of this. And tennis, I think I could really turn this into a career. And then off he went. But if you think of um, those players that have the best footwork in the game of tennis, you gotta think of um, those names that come up. It's not a coincidence. A lot of those came from soccer backgrounds, those that were really good at footwork ever before they ever picked up a racket or were working on it as they were, as they were practicing. So along with this, providing the necessary tangible resources. Um, obviously, little Johnny is not going to be able to drive himself to the game. He's not going to be able to afford all that sports equipment. So you're providing that for them. So then that's our stage of sampling. So specialization, ages 13 to 15. So we begin to narrow down maybe one or two sports. So we've maybe got football and basketball going on. So in this time, in, unless we're interested in ignoring what's developmentally appropriate, what we can do is allow still for a mix of free play and structured practice. 
as they are developing physically and cognitively, they're able to handle more structure, more structured uh, practice, but still allowing for that fun component of the activity. Allowing children that choice in their own activities. I, I know quite a few parents where it's, it's quite unnerving for them to allow their child to go out and pursue a sport that they don't know. Um, I've experienced this myself as Sam has expressed, you know, what sports he's interested in. I'm like, I don't even, I don't know anything about that. Now, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't know the first thing of how to coach him in that, but then I have to catch myself. That's not even my role. <laughs> my role would be to just be there and support him and provide for what he needs in that, in that arena. So encourage a respectful coach-athlete relationship, a great context for learning how to, I mean, if you think later on when they get jobs, go to school, this is a great context to practice that type of relationship where someone's holding you accountable, where you're trying to reach a goal both individually but as a team. So progress from a leadership role to more following and supporting role. Um, so that, that parent, they, they early on, they certainly take on that role as that, that prime say in what we do. But then we move on to what a lot of parenting educators talk about, parents as managers taking on that role. If they're not involved in every single detail, but they're still involved. So providing more financial and emotional support, the stakes are getting higher and sort those fees a lot of times. So being able to step in and help out with that. Still holding off in many cases that, um, that maybe that um, encouragement that you're getting from others to specialize. So still delaying in many cases that intense sports specialization until late adolescence. So let's go to that last stage. So investment, ages 15 on, one sport perhaps in elite skill development. So we'll bring it back to this point. To become an elite athlete, children do not need to specialize or put all their investment into early on. And I wanted to ask the group here, what are maybe some examples that you can think of? We've brought up maybe one or two, but if you think of your experience, you know, watching professional sports, or even just those you know personally, what are some examples of this principle of, you know, providing proof that the big lie is just that, the big lie that we don't have to specialize early? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, there was a great clip of him early on. I don't know if it was his rookie year, but it was very early on of him playing at like a charity event where he was playing baseball and he just hit just a flat out home run. I mean, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't by chance. That's something that was very much a part of him. I haven't heard him talk specifically about that, but I imagine if we had him here in the room, he would talk a lot about the skills that he gained that translated over to his basketball career. Great example. Any other examples that come to mind? Okay, so tell us a little more. His Heisman Trophy winner was drafted in the first round by the uh, Athletics. We had a choice to do both. Obviously, mm -hmm. he plays pretty high level. Yeah, okay, great. Other examples? <coughs> Ryan, what about you? Any examples that come to your mind? Yeah, my younger brother played pro sports. He played basketball. In fact, he would continue to play pickup ball with the basketball team all the way up until he was in K-State. Um, childhood friend Kevin Curtis walked on to play football at Utah State after his LDS mission, had done a lot mm -hmm. of other things out throughout his life. Um, you, you look at Abby Wambach, she said she got tough dodging the hockey pucks of her brothers, made her into a world-class soccer athlete. And mm -hmm. one of my favorites is Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan didn't know the broadside of the barn for basketball. He was a soccer player and a swimmer until he came to the United States. And you saw the story career he had in the, in the NBA. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think these give us um, some examples because we do hear, um, you hear the examples of like the Williams sisters or you hear the examples um, like Tiger Woods. And yes, but in many cases we need to remember we're talking about the elites of the elites of the elites in that case. And also, it's not the most common path, because for every one of those examples, we can give you quite a few more in those, among those professional athletes where it wasn't just one single sport, that there were many that they were involved in. So take home message for this, assuming you don't actually want to ruin the, the experience for your child. So a parent's goal should reflect a child's stage of participation, their age, and the goals for participation. What are we even wanting to get from this? This ties into the point that we'll make about communication of what's being communicated about what we're actually looking for from sport. So again, we don't need to rehash this point. Starting early and directing resources toward elite participation in one sport is not the only pathway to success. 
And then a question of what kind of environment are parents, the coaches, and the league creating? You know, what is the goal? What's the mission? If we were to ask the, this, it's a favorite question I always ask when we're talking to league administrators that are wanting us to help out with their league. I ask them, what's your mission statement? And I get two responses. One is, uh, I know we have one, I don't know where it is, or I don't think we have one. That's a really great thing to get together if you don't have it as, as a family, approaching your sport participation as a family. What's your mission statement? What's the overall goal? Are we looking for, you know, are we looking for elite level participation? Or are we looking more for something that's going to give us the skills that, that carry over into other activities? And I think this, that ties pretty well with this second point. So making college, uh, college scholarship or professional participation the goal. That's a great way um, to potentially ruin the experience for your child. This is a figure that we use often. The data is, you know, it's aging at this point, but it still gets the point across. So the example here that we're using is football. So in 2015, 3.2 million youth participating in youth football throughout the United States. From that, over 73,000 participating in the NCAA. And then less than 2% of those participants being drafted to play professionally. So giving us a, a figure here of 0 0.0005, eventually going on to play professionally. And now I recognize not everyone within that first number has that as a goal, but still the point remains that these are pretty poor odds. Um, if you're banking on that in terms of like a scholarship or making money off of this as a career, um, the odds aren't really in your favor. And there might be other activities, maybe heading down to Vegas that might actually, you, your odds might actually be better as a way of earning money for, um, earning money for college. So from this one, it's, it's simple to take home message. Your child's a lot more likely to end up being a teacher, a fireman, an entrepreneur, or a lawyer than a professional athlete. And this is a clip that I just love. So it is an example from an elite athlete. But I want you to listen to the message and pretend, you know, try and take this clip even out of the context of basketball. One of the best memories I had is when we moved into our, our first apartment. No, no bed, no furniture, and we just all sat in the living room and just hugged each other. Because we, that's what we, we thought we made. Man. When, you, when something good happens to you, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to look back to what brought me here. And you wake me up in the middle of the night in the summer times, making me run up the hill, making me do push-ups, screaming at me from the sideline of my games at eight or nine years old. We weren't supposed to be here. You made us believe. You kept us off the street. Put clothes on our backs, food on the table. When you didn't eat, you made sure we ate. You went to sleep hungry. You sacrificed for us. You the real MVP. thoughts came up watching that clip what came to your mind yeah in my mind I guess there's a fine line between being supportive and being that mom rooting your kid on and then being the mom that's putting pressure on but you feel like you're doing the same thing there must be a line that's crossed at some point. Mm -hmm. I guess, I don't know, where is that line? Yeah, and that's a question that we get asked a lot is, you know, this whole conversation of, of pressure versus support and when do we cross that line of when have we crossed, crossed over into pressure. 
I think the greatest antidote to that is that communication that we often talk about, on that two-way street between parent and child. Of oftentimes those things are just assumed. It's a lot like that that idea of like when I talk to a league administrator, it's like, what's your what's your mission statement? You know, not even just for one kid. We're talking about hundreds of kids, maybe thousands, and we don't have a clear sense of direction for them. That can definitely lead into a situation where we've got two very different goals that haven't been communicated. One just likes being out in the soccer field, you know, picking dandelions and that cupcake at the end of the game, while the other ones, we're going pro. And there's a wide gap there. It's probably not going to always be that wide, but if we haven't talked about it and that a gap that wide begins to exist, that can bring up a lot of problems. That's when we start to see those, you know, those arguments on the sidelines or after the game or the car ride home that's just miserable. I mean, there's even um, one work that we read this last year that talked about you know, a lot of athletes will actually ask um, their friends to ride home with them so their dad can't yell at them after the game because someone else is in the car with me. That's the kind of thing that we see when, this, when we start to see this gap, and that gap arises when we don't have check-ins, when we don't check in you know, beginning of the season, mid-season, and end season. Of what are, you li- are you liking this? Is this what we're wanting? Um, and I think that's what I, I mean. And one of the points I want to get across with that video is you know, I could imagine Kevin Durant at, at any sort of event, you know, being honored for, you know, um, getting a pre- prestigious award for his accomplishment in medicine, in engineering. If basketball hadn't worked out, I would put my money on that he still would have found himself somewhere that wasn't on the streets, as he mentioned in his statement. It's like, you kept us off the streets, you got us somewhere. We weren't supposed to be here, but you got us here. And so, I, I, especially in those situations, it might be really difficult to see, okay, what's What's crossing the line? What's crossing that line of, of support and pressure? Um, Travis, anything you'd, you'd add to that? Uh, you nailed it. I think it's the communication. And, and I think it's important for parents to realize that this is different for every child, not just within your own family, but across you know, your, your child's peers. Um, you might be doing something that another parent is doing, and, and that parent is actually doing what the child needs, and, and you're not. So don't compare yourself necessarily externally. Uh, to other folks in the bleachers, uh, and, and don't necessarily act the same way with one child that you do with another. Uh, our different children have di- different needs and desires in sport, and uh, and we need to sort of understand that role and relationship sort of on a one-to-one basis. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and and something we need to remember is even if you do make it to that elite of the elite level, eventually there comes a point where someone tells you, you know what, you're cut, you're cut from the team you're no longer good enough to play and you might have a good 40, 50 years of life still ahead of you and this avenue is no longer viable. And, and certainly there's going to be other you know, options for you within that sport still, like coaching or something like that. But not, not that I want to approach it strictly as a, you know, assuming that it's going to fail so we need a backup plan, but what is that thing that's, that's going to be after sport? You know, we can put a lot of our attention into sport and allow them to just enjoy that experience, enjoy being a child in that activity, but what comes next? Yeah. I, I'm probably coming at a very different angle because I don't know anything about sports. But I thought what was compelling about that video clip was his memory, a very ordinary memory from his upbringing of being with his family and having this group hug. And so I just think that, you know, and he's, he's you know, uh, apparently a famous athlete. And here's an ordinary moment in his life that was incredibly striking to him. Mm-hmm. So I think um, it's another lesson for parents to just think about that too. Um, mm-hmm. The ordinary moments in a child's life that um, we need to celebrate, not necessarily those yeah. star moments yeah. on the field. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I, I shouldn't have assumed, I, I, I mean, I apologize, I should have given that some context of, so that's Kevin Durant winning the most valuable player um, in the National Basketball Association, so reaching that, that peak level within that sport. And the, the memory that he talks about is, is that time, family hug there. And so it, it is important, you know, the children are going to remember kind of those key uh, cornerstone moments. Those are going to be those memories. So maybe they do kind of miss, they miss that field goal, they miss that soccer kick. And maybe in what they don't actually remember is that kick that they missed, but the hug they got from mom or dad right after. I said, you know what? This doesn't impact the amount of love that I have for you. You're still my child, and I couldn't be more proud. I love the effort you put on out there today. Um, so it's it's a great point. I wish we just had. I wish we had more time. So number three, engage in inappropriate behavior at competitions. This kind of relates back to that video that we watched. 
this is a really good way to mess up the experience is act crazy, act inappropriate on the sidelines. You know, from research, we actually have this really great breakdown of as far as the athletes are concerned, what do they want? And the next slide will be what they do want. But this first one is, if you were to ask them, what do they not want? They break it down by before, during, and after that competition. Before, what they don't want, comments focused on child's performance, communicating expectations about winning. All right, we're going to win this today. Tactical advice with no knowledge. That's, that's my favorite. Dad or mom that doesn't know anything about basketball, that's giving them the playbook of how we're going to win this game today. Um, that's just not what the child's looking, looking for from the parent in that moment. During competition, I, thought this first, I always think this first one is interesting, intimidation towards opponents. You might even think that they appreciate that. I'm sure there's some children that would, but on average, in general, they don't actually appreciate that. They don't see it as needful. They don't even want it during participation. Drawing attention towards themselves, criticizing, coaching child or team, disputes with other parents, coaches, officials, <laughs> giving those contradictions to the coach's instructions, repeating instructions. Um, Marshall, another member of the lab, um, he does a lot with like audio recording, so he'll hook up one of these microphones to parents. And there was one that he was doing where the instruction of, so it was soccer, I think, where the instruction of kick the ball was given. Do you, have any, do you remember what that figure triple was? Digits. Yeah, triple digits of just from one parent, that instruction of kick the ball. So like they, they've got it. They know like the, the point of soccer is to kick that ball. So <laughs> after a couple hundred times, it might be time to give them at least, at least a new bit of instruction there. But then going along with other points we've made, booing opposing team. After the competition, criticism of performance, blaming outcomes on referee or others, or focusing on the negatives of performance. This, this can be really tough because you might know full well. I mean, you might have that knowledge in and out about that sport. You might know exactly what they needed to do. So like say Sam, if he decides to play, um, play tennis, heaven help him if he decides that because then I'm going to really need Katie's feedback because I might actually know exactly what he needed to do or what he should not have done. But still, even if I have that, if that's not what he's looking for and that's not what he's ready for, because you may have a child, you may have a child, but this is why it's communication. Again, that's why it's so important. You may have a child that's like, bring it on. Give it to me. I want to know what I could do better. In that case, it might be appropriate, but you might have the child that just needs, needs to sleep on it. Or, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow we can talk about it over breakfast. But commonly in that car ride home, that's, that's the last thing that they're looking for. So what do they want? So helping the athlete be physically prepared, attending to the child's needs for mental preparation, during the, the competition, etiquette and compliance, positive tone and body language, control over their emotions, really just being that role model of what should my participation, what should it look like? Giving that encouragement, maybe after poor execution, after competition, p providing positive feedback on effort and attitude. You know, that's, that's the most common thing I'll say to Sam or Raj when they're playing is I, I tell them, I just love seeing you try so hard. You know, when Sam comes to the sideline, he's just sweaty. Or, you know, he, it was so cute. He was just, he was by far the shortest on his soccer team this year. He got so close to store, scoring a goal. And I just, I told him, man, you ran across that field with kids of six inches taller than you when you were in front of all of them. I loved watching you do that. So yeah, he missed, but he still walked away, you know, as this tiny little six-year-old walking away like this and feeling really good about what he had done. Providing realistic feedback. And this point that we already discussed, giving feedback when the child is ready for it. So I think as far as a take home here, engage in self-monitoring. If we were to have that higher light reel of you on the sideline, what would that look like? Also collect behavioral feedback. Spouse, a friend, someone else, I mean, another parent of, um, that's a parent of another player on the team, ask them for their feedback of, hey, how do we, I mean, it might sound a little odd, but I think if we really want to see a change in the context of youth sport, this is the kind of thing that we'll see more of. Our parents saying things like, hey, can, how am I doing as a parent on the sidelines? What kind of feedback would you have for me? And you know there will be those parents that will be honest with you. There will be some that might be shy and hold back, but there will be those. If you, you'll know who they are. 
Um, that won't hold back and let you know exactly what they think. So failing to communicate with your child. Number four, so this is, a, and this is one that we bring up all the time. And we just cover one little piece of this um, conversation about communication. So to Travis's point earlier, communication that a parent sees as supportive could be interpreted by the child as, as pressuring. And it's critical to know what your child wants from you when communicating us about sports. So this is common language that we hear. You know, I kind of spoil it here, but once, you know, say you weren't able to be at the child's game and you get home at the end of the day, you know they had a game. What's that first question often going to be? Did you win? Did you win? How many hits did you get? How much did you play? You know, these are things that they're certainly not meant to be, um, you know, harmful by any means, but they might be interpreted on the child's part as, as pressuring. They might attach to like, well, my value must be attached to how many hits I did get or how much I did play or did we win? So parents, we, we tell them, okay, here's some ones you can replace that with pretty easily. Asking them, what did you do well today? Did you have fun today? What did you learn? You know, not you know, going beyond just being kind of yes or no responses or three goals or you know, those ones from the previous slide. These ones allow for conversation. You know, it might spur on a conversation of, man, I'm really just hating this sport. I really don't like it anymore. Man, I'm really liking this. I, I think I might want to go try out for that elite team next year. These are really great questions because they open the door to, to those types of conversations. And if nothing else, if you feel like I have nothing else that I can say, I don't know what to say, this is, this is a perfect go-to. I love watching you play. It isn't I love when you score a goal, I love when your team wins. I just love watching you play. Win, lose, playing time, whatever it is. And inherent in that message is love for you as my child. Yes, you're an athlete, but above all, you're, you're my kid. So and last, number five, work poorly with coaches. Do we have any coaches in here? Okay, so we've got, we've got a handful. So if you've got any feedback as we um, navigate these last few slides, I'd love to hear it. So uh, oftentimes parents are concerned with feeling isolated from their child's participation. Um, and that coaching practices are stressing out their child. Coaches, on the other hand, are often concerned about the over-involvement of parent and lack of knowledge. Our coaches that are in the room, any concerns with that? Lack of knowledge on their part, but over-involvement at the same time? Okay, I'm seeing some nods of the head. So a discussion question, we don't have time for it right now, but how might the relationship between coach and parent impact the child's overall experience? Again, this is a prime opportunity to show them how uh, a good relationship functions. A good relationship like this, even in times of high stress, might be able to work. So with this point, some ways to work well with coaches is, is trust that coach. Yeah, they may not be the most trained coach in the world. We coach t-ball for um, Sam's group because no other parents were able to do it. I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge, but we did do our best. And I think coaches even if they don't have all the training in the world, they are trying their best. So trust them. Communicating with the coach at the right place at the right time. I'm sure the coach is here. We could get some um, testimonials or stories on how that's not to be done. Maybe right after a game in the heat of the moment. A lot of you know, people that we talk to, there's some sort of like 24-hour rule that if you have a concern, wait 24 hours, come talk to me at the right time. Gain knowledge about the sport so that you can be a little bit more informed of, of what it takes um, to succeed in that sport. Seek the appropriate amount of involvement of you know, where, where are you best needed and how much are you needed in that sport. Volunteer. Uh, I don't think the coaches would hate that idea if you have some way that you can volunteer and help lessen their load. They would appreciate that at any time. And then lastly, keep that sport participation in perspective. Uh, things might feel really big in the heat of the moment. But again, if we kind of give that time to wait it out, we'll find that oftentimes those issues aren't as big as we thought that they were. So positive parenting and organized youth sport is demonstrated by parental involvement that supports children opportunities to achieve their potential both in and out of sport, engage in healthy psychosocial interactions, and experience a range of positive developmental outcomes. So again, sport is a great context for development. We oftentimes get asked, okay, use sports, good or bad. 
It's not that simple. It could be both. You see a wide range of that. It really depends on the environment that we create for them and the interactions that take place um, between parent and athlete. And so lastly, we'll leave you with this. It's not what you do for your children, but what you have taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. Um, so again, sport, a great context for positive youth development. There's a whole lot that it can provide for us. Our, whole, our country is, is littered with fields and courts and people willing to organize sports in those venues. And so if we capitalize on this opportunity to use this context for positive youth development, then we won't have to have discussions of, well, what do we do about those darn parents? We'll just have discussions of how can we get to the next step? How can we further um, this positive environment for our athletes? Um, so that's what we have for you. Thank you for being here today.